Hi, everybody. Um, excuse my rather hoarse voice. Uh, my name is Simon Ramshaw, and I'm managing <clears throat> managing director of Aconia Lasers. Uh, we're a subsidiary organisation of Aconia Corporation, and we look after their interests in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. I'd love to thank you so much for joining this webinar. We've run quite a few webinars over the last few weeks, and it's sort of all culminated in where we are at at the minute, which is to actually show some live demonstrations. So this webinar is entitled Combining True Non-Thermal Laser with Standard Chiropractic Therapies. And in part one, we, we got so many requests as to what sort of conditions we'd like to treat. We've decided to separate them. So this specific one is going to be on musculoskeletal pain relating to the spine. Uh, we've got a really good spread of attendees looking at the spreadsheet all the way across the pond. Quite a lot of our American colleagues, so welcome. Uh, and also as far out as Dubai. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll obviously assist you further on in the webinar. You, <clears throat> you'll all notice the question and answers box, which is at the bottom of the screen. So if you'd like to type questions in as we go along, then we'd be more than happy to put them to Dr. Silverman and Dr. Gare after they finish their demonstrations. So at this juncture, I normally introduce them, but because of my voice, I'm going to ask Dr. Rob first to introduce himself and then Dr. Gare. Hey everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dr. Rob Silverman, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health, ACA Sports Council of Chiropractic in 2015. I've been a laser owner user for the past 12 years. And I will say very simply, it has revolutionized the way I practice chiropractic and functional nutrition. Hey, Dr. Gare. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Dr. Kirk Gare, and I practice in Southern California and the United States. And I've been using lasers since 2004. I do a ton of sports injuries. So I've worked with people from our uh, Los Angeles Angels and Los Angeles Dodgers, some Super Bowl champions, also some Olympic uh, gold medalists and world record holders. And like Dr. Silverman says, it totally transformed, revolutionized my practice. And one of the best things about it is it really kind of made my office recession proof with what we do because we get a steady stream of referrals because of how great our results are and that's even outside of the insurance networks and people don't mind paying cash for it particularly with athletes trying to enhance their sports performance people trying to avoid surgeries or trying to recover faster from them so I can't say enough about what the Arconia lasers have done for my practice and my life that's brilliant thank you very much for that uh, Kirk um, that, that's the whole part of a lot of these webinars that we do. It's trying to show especially the European and Middle Eastern uh, chiropractors and physicians uh, what the differences are between true non-thermal low-level laser and other techniques like um, infrared, like LED. Uh, there's also shockwave that gets used as well. So I think as we're going along, when Dr. Silverman and Dr. Gare are doing their demonstrations, they'll go into why they actually use the laser for this specific condition. So first, we're going to hand control across to Dr. Silverman, who's going to go into uh, lower back pain, which is going to include discogenic pain, stenosis, um, and um, anything else, Rob, that you can think of. <laughs> Absolutely, don't worry about it. Sorry about that last second throw at you. So I just wanted to quickly show you, um, Dr. Dr. Kirk is going to be talking about these specific handhelds, but this is what a base station looks like. Um, we've got two accelerates, one EBRL, and this is the whole base station docking. So again, Dr. Kirk is going to do that. I just wanted to show you what the base station looked like. I had it with me right here. I'm going to put it all down. And what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use specifically the PL Touch in the handheld. And as you bring it into focus, you're going to see the FX635. So I really wanted to piggyback on what um, Simon had said before. He did a great job of talking about laser infrared so for me i wrote some notes down we i like to think of laser as photochemical not photothermal so the body absorbs these photons that are emitted out they absorb these photons stimulates the healing process at a cellular level one of the words that are very synonymous with photochemical or low level laser is photobiomodulation so just a brief overview the, benefic the beneficial tissue effects of low-level laser photobiomodulation can include almost all tissues and organs of the body. Some of note pertaining to what we want to talk about today are 
connective tissue, neuron, bone, muscle, joint, epithelium, and blood. These are all uh, seen and depicted as citated in dose response September 2nd, 2019. So this is not something that I'm saying, this is not something that any of the Oconia laser uh, salesmen are saying, educators, whatever they may be. We're talking about science-driven literature. In addition, the first thing I want to do is the handheld. I want to take a look at what we call the PL Touch. This is called the Workhorse. This was the originator. It's less than two pounds. And the beauty of it is that it has two heads. So you'll see when Dr. Kirk works with his, they look kind of like a cell phone, they're fabulous. The difference is this has two specific heads. So I'm able to split the heads as I'll show you. I'll be doing what we call some photochemical um, irradiation to the spinal cord and some to the extremity. So for right now, I'm gonna bring in my model, if you will, come on in and have a seat. So very interesting, let's talk about lower back pain. And we speak about lower back pain so much, we talk about it in the concept of mechanical lower back pain. So I'm gonna talk about together lower back pain, discogenic pain, and we're gonna talk about stenosis because the positioning is very similar to all three. So I'm able to captivate them all in one specific position. So again, I'm going to, I want to simply show you how easy this is. I want to come to the front and I want you, because so many people ask, how do you do it? You should be able to see that. Press start and start, you'll see the lights turn on. So you'll see one here and one here. Again, the key to this is the ability to split the heads. And the reason we split the heads is we can work two different areas and the other reason you want to split the head is one you're going to work with an afferent nerve and one you can work with what we call an efferent nerve. So for the lower back, if we could just position you, that would be great. So a lot of times, I will just go to the lower back and I'll go right on the side of the glute because I'm just saying that she's got right side of lower back pain. And you just hold it. Now, right now I'm using my hands. If you could understand that my hands could be a stand, I wouldn't have to be in the room. And that's one of the beauties of it. it. You can use this in a point and shoot like I am now, or I'm gonna show you the movement. What I do a lot, which I really love, is I put the two heads together. Now I move them while I'm here. And the reason I'm moving them, the reason that I'm moving them is because I wanna turn the muscle on and off to get a better effect. So you don't want to go face down, do you? So again, I'm going face down. So this is for what I call mechanical lower back pain. You know, mechanical lower back pain is really interesting in that there's some interesting thought processes to the concept of mechanical lower back pain. And I'm going to elucidate more on that in one quick moment. So now I'm here. Now where I want to show you something a little different. I want to introduce to you the FX 635. So here's this Gothic looking FX. The FX is interesting in that it has a multitude of FDA clearances. The FX has a multitude, yes, you can see it perfectly clear. The FX has a multitude of FDA clearances. In that it's FDA clear, I'll come over here. It's FDA clearances started with plantar fasciitis. It also started with chronic lower back pain. And now it has one for nociceptive musculoskeletal, the full, pain, the full body. So right now you're seeing for mechanical lower back pain, I'm with Amy right here. And she is now just simply getting a laser treatment to her lower back. It's just that simple. It's a three diode attack. Each diode is circulating. So I just want to show you if I can. I'll point it up so you'll see it's circulating. So the beauty of the FX 635 in that it's circulating is that it covers more surface area than a handheld. So for mechanical lower back pain, we're using one, two, and three to differentiate the PL touch, if you will, with the FX 635, the PL touch has two heads, 7.5 milliwatts, 7.5 milliwatts. Each one of these diodes, one, 
two, and three. 17.5, 17.5, 17.5. This is a workhorse. I use this all the time in my office. Now, this is for mechanical lower back pain. For discogenic pain, the only real difference that I'm gonna do for discogenic pain is I'm gonna change the frequencies because the frequency is the amount that the light hits the lower back. In addition to that, I'm gonna stop it for a moment. Hey, you know what's gonna do? Thank you so much. So for discogenic pain, I know this is gonna seem strange to some people. I do a lot of movement with the laser. So I'm gonna laser her right now. You want and, to turn it and I'm just gonna have her go down and lean forward. I'm, not, I'm only having a lot of reflex so you can see what I'm doing. So now this is discogenic pain at a different frequency. I'm gonna have her bend forward. So I'm gonna do that so you can see that I'm actually lasering her lower back. Now for stenosis, I'm actually gonna lean her back. So I'm a big proponent in movement with laser. A lot of people don't move. You don't have to, you can just have them go face down, but the outcomes will be tremendously different. Now, I'm gonna go back to the FX635 if you don't mind, and I'm actually gonna have her right face up. And while she's face up, once again, for discogenic pain, I'm gonna have some movement in the leg. And I can lift this up a little higher so she can clear her leg through the laser. You know, so many people have reached out and asked about a hands-on idea with the laser. And there's nothing more synergistic with, than laser with chiropractic treatment. So laser on its own, huge takeaway. Laser with movement, laser with adjustment, bigger takeaway. And, you know, uh, Dr. Kirk did a great job. It is not only revolutionized my practice and clinical outcomes, I don't take any insurance. We're all cash practice. It has enabled us to be an all cash practice because of things that we're doing that are different than the other practitioners in the area. And um, being one of the only people in the area who have the laser really imbues patients with enthusiasm to come in to want to get treated. And while she's sitting there, so you can see you'll get the front. Also, a couple of the quick things I wanted to do. So there's multiple positions. I'm going to come down here. There's multiple positions with the FX635. Interesting, the literature on lower back and laser. I wanted to share this with you. Low-level laser has shown an increase in pain relief and a decrease in interleukin-6. IL-6 is a critical element for the cytokine storm. We all talk about that. But interesting in that um, interleukin six and eight really lead you down a path of chronic lower back pain. So there's another study that talks about that and it decreases the inflammatory microenvironment in the disc area, in the lumbar spine and in the annulus fibrosis area. So laser doesn't work just at a muscle level. It works at a biochemical level. In addition to that, there's another study that it shows that it decreases C-reactive protein once again, your interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. So to recap everything, it works at a muscle level. It turns muscles on and off. We'll see some muscle imbalance suggestions later. It also works at a biochemical. So I believe chiropractors, when they mix mechanical and biochemical, is where they're going to get their critical outcome. And last but not least, a lot of people ask me about the frequency, the frequency of light. Here are some of your frequencies, lower back pain, 9, 16, 42, 53. Discogenic pain, 4, 9, 33, 60. Stenosis, 9, 16, 5,000, 10,000. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kirk. I'm trying to keep it nice and concise. Ask your questions because we're going to stay for a half hour and answer questions after. So Kirk, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rob. That was amazing every time i listen to you i i learned something as well too thinking how i can uh 
simplify things and make things smoother. So, and I think that's an important thing that he showed you there is a lot of times you can get caught up in thinking, okay, what's the protocol for this? What's the protocol for that? When we think of regions, when we think of things simplifying, get the laser on there, let the laser do a lot of its work. When we're looking at like with disks, he cited a lot of good studies there. There's even a study uh, on the cervical region is that's what I'm going into a cervical pain, radiculopathy and discogenic pain is there was a study that was released that showed that laser, uh, low level laser, like the class two laser that we're talking about actually stimulates these extracellular matrix proteins to help to repair the annulus and to help to repair the disc. And I've seen that in my practice where I've had some patients where we do laser and we actually can see on follow-up MRIs to where these discs, these disc herniations do actually change and do actually shrink and in some cases completely resolve and go away. So keep that in mind as we're talking about uh, anything with the neck, whether it is just cervical pain from a whiplash injury or if it's radicular pain or discogenic pain. What I like to do is I always like to start with getting an objective measurement from the patient of where they have pain and how much it is. So uh, first thing, simple thing to do is have them start off just doing ranges of motion. Have them flex forward, look to see if there's a facial expression of pain and point it out to the person too. Oh, I can see that really hurts there, you're making a face. Get them to go measure the range, how far they're going, and get them to give you an objective measurement of how much their pain is on a scale of one to 10. And we all know, I'm sure people across the world are the same to where they're terrible about giving you a number. They'll jump around and say, well, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's a three, sometimes it's this. Make sure that they give you, quantify something right then and there, because this is how you can start to generate referrals with your laser too, because what I found is I can usually drop their pain somewhere between 10 to at least 30% on that first visit. Certain types of conditions, it'll be more, but I like to under promise and over produce. So I tell them, I want you to do your range of motion, pay attention to how far you can go, see if it feels stiff, tight, painful, what do you experience? Then we're gonna do the laser on you and we're gonna do these immediately following and we're gonna see how much that dropped your pain already. So we'll have them flex forward, extend back, you know, left and right, your basic ranges of motion, laterally flex each direction, get a pain rating on there. If you wanna do more orthopedic tests, you can, you know, anvil tests, etc. I also like to test the strength of their muscles as well. So I'll have them press into my hand with forward flexion, and I'll see how much pressure they can generate and ask them, does that increase your pain? And I, now make sure when they're doing these tests to tell them only go up to the point where you have pain. Don't you know feel like you gotta force it because we don't wanna strain them. I'll have them press to test their lateral flexors of each side, their extensors as well. You can also test you know, for rotation, having them turn their hand, their head into your hands resistance to get a good rating on there. Now, what we'll do is let's say if I'm using the uh, Accelerate or the EVRL, we're gonna go in there and as you can see, let's see, you can see the mode on there. Let me turn this down, this light down so you can see this better. So there we have, you can go to the mode select and I've pre-programmed in here different protocols. So we've got things like brain, bone, migraine, heat, basic. So basic are the settings that Dr. Uh, Silverman talked about of the four, nine, uh, sorry, nine, 16, 42 and 53. I use those for a lot of things. A lot of times that'll be my go-to starting off settings on there. And if I'm using a, the Accelerate, what I like to do is just like what Dr. Rob did for the low back, I will simply get the laser on the neck. Now, if I've got the PL touch, then I would have two heads on that area on both sides of the neck. Or I could do one on the top of the head and one on the neck. Those are ways that I will position it for neck pain. And then what I like to do while the patient has this going on is I like to have them do those ranges of motion. The key thing is, while they're doing that range of motion, I tell them, don't try to force it, just go to where it doesn't increase your pain. So if that's only from here to there, that it doesn't increase it, then we'll only do that. We see this a lot, particularly with auto accidents, patients with fresh sports injuries where they have a strained neck to where they can barely move like this. You get that laser on there, you get it going on the neck, even on the front of the neck here. And as they start going through it, you can see as time goes on, they start to move more and start to be able to move it in a smoother, larger way. And that's when their eyes start popping out of their heads. And they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can't believe how fast I'm getting a change here. So that's a basic one for just simple neck pain. Um, and if it's radicular pain or discogenic pain, we're gonna do the same thing. Just like Dr. Rob said, all we'll do is change some of those frequencies. The, the discogenic pain, we'll put in those settings of 5,000 and 10,000 with the nine and the 16, because when we look at the research that came out of the Soviet Union, they had 
put lasers into their state-sponsored standard medical care by 1974. And they found that one of the best frequencies for chronic pain was 10,000 hertz. So that's one reason why we'll use that for that particular uh, type of a condition. When it's uh, radicular pain, we'll use the neurological settings of 4, 9, 33, and 60. So really the, the protocols are almost the same. It's just we change some different frequencies to stimulate the tissue in a different way. When we're thinking about fr frequencies, a good way to understand why they affect tissue in different ways is let's talk about music. Like I'm a musician, I play guitar, I write music, record music. People around the world love to listen to music. When you listen to music and it's got different frequencies, you might have the same instrument, like let's say a guitar or a piano, but when you hit different keys or strings, you get a different frequency and vibration of sound. Now, when that happens, you will stimulate the body in a different way. Some songs will make you feel sad. Some will make you feel amped up and energized. And we look at certain tones in the brain. We know that 528 hertz uh, of sound can actually make you feel a feeling of love and peace and well well-being. 110 hertz of sound can stimulate the temporal parietal lobe and give you a sense of, uh, of spatial awareness or an out-of-body experience. So same thing with light. When we do lasers and we have different light frequencies in here, it's going to stimulate the tissue in different ways. Now let's talk about what else I'll do. If it's the FX, and Dr. Rob, if you want to show this afterwards, you can do the same setup to where you've got either coming to the sides or you do the Mohawk distribution. For the neck with the FX, I usually like having the central diode right here and the two other ones on the sides here. Now, what I can do if I've got, I always like to use the lasers, the handhelds in a stand so I don't have to stand there the whole time. So this way I can click it in and have it there on the neck and then I'm free to also do other supportive therapies. So for example, I might have this laser going on the patient's neck here you know, on the front or on the back, and then have them actively stimulate the muscle. Like Dr. Silverman said, when you activate that muscle, you get a much better result. So you can have them press into your hand going forward, press going back, press going to the side, to the other side, and you can resist their rotation as well. What you will see is as you continue to do this, is that the patient's strength will increase and their pain will go down as you're doing the laser on that area. Very, very simple thing that you can do, regardless of if it's a cervical disc herniation or, or if it's a, a recent sprain, sprain, strain, sprain. What you're really looking at is trying to do what that patient can tolerate and letting the laser do, the, do its work, do the magic. Now, let's say that I've got, I'd love to use the uh, EVRL in the chronic cases, particularly, because we know when we combine those two wavelengths, you do get a faster result. Dr. Silverman, perhaps you can go into the results of the study that you performed on that, showing that it is a faster result. All the lasers are fantastic, but that one is faster when you do have the combination, particularly with these chronic types of uh, pain cases. So. I would like to get the laser aimed back at the neck and then I'll stack it with say getting the adjuster tool and I'll go along the spine say just from T1 all the way up to the occiput and I'll use the adjuster tool just to kind of mobilize the, the spine. Now why do I do that simultaneously? When we get the adjuster tool on the cervical spine or on the lumbar spine, um, you are stimulating the the mechanical uh, recept the mechanoreceptors, the afferent mechanoreceptors. So when you're doing the adjuster tool, you're stimulating those neurons to fire to the brain while you have the laser on there. So it's what I like to call recalibrating the nervous system. We're trying to get those mechanoreceptors, proprioceptors, nociceptors to kind of reset and recalibrate. And when you stack those therapies together, we seem to get a better result with it. I will also take the Erconia Precursor and work over tight muscles uh, when I find trigger points. I will simultaneously, while I've got the laser on that area, I can also get in there too then with the Precursor and work over to try to release some of the scar tissue. <clears throat> and I do that in the low back too. So I'll do the same things like Dr. Silverman will do. And a lot of times <clears throat> for the low back, I'll also use the adjuster tool simultaneously or a precursor, or I love to get the movement going. So again, you can do it simple. It's just point and shoot. But anytime if you stack what Dr. Silverman's talked about with movement um, or muscle resistance, you just get a far more phenomenal result with that. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Silverman. And if you want to add anything to what I said there on the upper extremity, that'd be great. No, I mean, you would do a great job. And, and one thing that I noticed that, that you were sharing was, so everybody knows he was running into this area. He was running it into brachial plexus coming between the two yeah. skin. 
So he wanted to upregulate. So one of the big takeaways, and I'm happy to hear that Simon's giving us a creative license on all this, is that um, what most people don't understand, and I'm gonna show you coming up in the sciatic nerve, is that the red light works phenomenally for action potentials of peripheral nerves. So that's why Dr. Kirk was doing that right over here and was upregulating. And uh, you'll see that we we practice very similarly in that right. we do a lot of happy and things of that nature. What's interesting is, you know, in reference to the frequency, there's a reason why there was different frequencies. And I'm going to actually take it to the next step and say there's a reason why we constantly change the frequency. So he's a musician. He was awesome. I was a basketball player. It was great when I played against guys who weren't that good. I could go at the same frequency, the same speed. But once somebody was really good and said he's moving there, I had to change and adapt. And the body, after a certain period of time, we want to change different frequencies. And that's why we go up to 10,000. Yeah. And um, you, you led me in. Thank you for the softball, even though I know you weren't a softball player or a football player. Right. <laughs> the cochlear violet red laser, I was the lead clinical investigator on it. And here's what we found. We found that without question, the results were stellar. It beat most red light lasers by about 20% and it increased range of motion. And we, we maybe we can go through the difference real quick because I know we always cover this in webinars. The red and violet are very different. The red light's more musculoskeletal, parasympathetic. The violet light is more sympathetic and also uh, works more antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal. So I appreciate the setup. I'm going to hit a couple and then I'm going to set you up, I promise. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to. I appreciate it. So, You're welcome. I, thank you. Um, so interesting. I, I just want to recap what we did before and I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Kirk um, recap. Remember, lower back pain, mechanical lower back pain is distinctively different than discogenic pain and stenosis. We know if something's stenotic, it's an issue that has a closure. It's usually a closure in the canal, if you will. Um, in addition, lower back pain isn't really lower back pain. Well, just I specifically pointed it at the lower back in the idea that pe patients were coming in. I'm a big proponent in that he who treats the side of pain is lost. The laser can be very diagnostic. We're going to do that in another succeeding webinar. In addition to that, I know there were a couple of quick questions. So I have my handy dandy little you know communicator. And number one was goggles. There was a question on goggles and, um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Gare, please, uh, you chime in also uh, when you come back on that we don't have to use the goggles because it's in, a, we call it a class two laser. So there's no true damage to the eyes you don't have to wear. It's an option. Whereas some of the hot lasers, if you will, or lasers that produce heat that are photothermal, you have to because it damages the retina and the eye. Now, don't think the higher the number, the better, kind of like going to a four-star restaurant. It's actually the lower the number, the better. And I think we had one more, um, I think there was one more over here. Ah, the question was, how do you decide which laser to use? And you know, I'm a little spoiled because I have them all. And I'm not telling you to get them all right now. I understand I didn't get I didn't get them all. The first one I got was the PL Touch because that was offered. Now I use different lasers according to my ability. If I want to do what we call upregulation and allow muscles to turn on and get stronger or more balanced through ATP and calcium movement, I'm probably going to use the handheld. Everything you can do with the handheld, you can do with the FX. So having said all that, if you have any more questions on that, I'm, both, both doctors will be very happy to answer that. So I'm going to bring my model back in. I want to talk about sciatica. And here we go as far as I'm going to have her life face down. So how do I know it's sciatica? Face up, I'm sorry, my mistake. So how do I know that it's sciatica? There's a couple of different tests. So I do what we call a neural tension test. You may say it's a straight leg raise. So we'll do a straight leg raise. And then I lift up her head. Sorry, I didn't mess the hair up. <laughs> so essentially, I'll go through the neurodynamics, so I'll position the ankles. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I have to treat you later now. Position the ankle in a different way. And let's say that I know and I ascertain, come sit face down, I'm able to ascertain that it is the sciatic nerve, not the tibial branch, not the 
fibular branch, not the um, scleral branch. So another way of doing it, and this is a great test for everybody, it's called a slump test. So let's say she had some pain going down her leg on her right leg, extend that out. I'll have her drop her head and then I'll do that. So if she has no pain in her lumbar spine, no lumbar pain, no discogenic, no mechanical lower back pain, and she still has no discomfort from that, I know that the issue is now outside the spine. So right face up, I'm gonna go get my PL touch over here. And right side, here we go. Now here's the beauty of the PL touch with the, the idea of the sciatica. I'm gonna get it right in her gluteus max, and I'm also gonna trace the tibial nerve right here. And I'll slowly, slowly, slowly try and lift it up. So as you saw, she made a face before, she's not gonna make that same face now. Do you have any questions on this? I will tell you this, one of the biggest takeaways I have with the PL touch and all the handhelds is very, very simply the ability to help ameliorate so many peripheral nerve issues. If you don't mind, could you flip like a pancake? I'm gonna put this over here. And I'm going into the right leg. I'm a little limited in my space in my basement. So you guys will have to work with me just a little bit. And here we go. And here we go. And now I'm working the sciatic. Who doesn't have a patient that comes in with some form of sciatic or a branch off the longest nerve of the body, the sciatic nerve? So I'm gonna pause that. That was very easy. And now we're simply gonna to go to musculoskeletal imbalances. Flip over one more time. So when I say musculoskeletal imbalances, some of the things you're gonna see in the lower back are gonna be a tight psoas and a weak glute. Let's just go for that. So psoas is interesting in that we'll do a little quick psoas test. Dr. Gear did a great job. He spoke about doing muscle tests, so press up. And she's pretty strong, she works out. Pressed up. Ah, you may not see that, but that's causing a little bit more of an issue. You see, she's lifting up her pelvis over here. So I'm going to get the PL touch. I'm just going to laser her in a psoas region. I'll put this down here. Hold that for me, please. Let the patient do a little work. You shouldn't have to do all the work and press up. And you can see a distinctive difference. So all I did was laser. Now what's beautiful, when you have the PL touch, you can put the PL touch right here. Remember the psoas muscle is T12 to L5, not touching the L5 disc. It's the only muscle that goes from the spine to the ilium, to the sacrum, to the lesser trochanter and extremity. And you can use this as a base and go through the whole regional area. Now I don't have to bring up the FX. All I'd have to do for the FX is very simply put the FX right in the psoas region because it's three diodes circulating would cover all the surface area needed. And there you have the psoas. Psoas is a critical element. Remember, it presses on the lumbar spine because it's anterior pelvic tilt. Monday morning takeaway. We used to call that, I'm from New York, so we have some funny statements. We call it the Monday morning money muscle. If you can fix the psoas on Monday morning, you're going to be able to help patients and see more patients. Flip over one more time. So musculoskeletal, we're going to talk about the glute. So again, we'll do a quick glute test. Everybody thinks this is a glute test. Press up. It's a hamstring test. We're going to take a 15 to 30 degrees off the abduction. Hold that. Press up. And she's pretty strong. You know, Amy works out all the time. So very simply, I'm just going to do it in a point and shoot once again. And we're just going to go in on the glute. Now, here's one of the advantages to the handheld Verse the FX 635. Can you line the back? And I'm going to ask you to do a glute bridge. So do, she can do the bridge. I'm able to get under here and I'm able to laser her glutes while she's contracting the muscle. That's the one thing I wouldn't be able to do if I was using the FX. So go flip back over. And again, I don't need to turn it on in the interest of time. There you go. And I could ask you to contract it. I could ask you to do some specific things. I'm a big believer of having people contract and relax the muscle. 
I know Dr. Gear talked about that. And the reason you want to do that is you want to get that ATP, you want to get that housing going in, you want to get through some physiological zones. And the last thing I want to talk about is the core. So lie on your back. So core, the best way to test the core is put your fingers right in someone's oblique. Remember, core is a 360 degree co-contraction all the way around your spine and your anterior and posterior spine. So if you press on your um, obliques and you feel it, so I feel it contracting, you now know that you probably have what they call a brace. Your corset is tight. So the beauty of that would very simply be press the start button. I'm gonna put the laser right by our hand. And because once again, I've got the PL touch, I can get right into the obliques. I can also move it. You can stand it. I'm now an imaginary stand. And now you can engage the core. Now you could also make it more effective. She did it for me. I can teach her how to brace. Push against me, pull that brace, and here we go. And the last thing while she's doing that, if I can go over here, hopefully you can see me. I can laser her brain because it's more mitochondrial function in the brain than any other body part. I can laser her brain while she's bracing. And once again, Life is easy because I can bring the FX635 and put it right on over her core and put it over her brain. Or if you have both, if you allow me to do that and just take one more split second, you can simultaneously reset the core and everybody's core is typically damaged after a lower back. Pain because when you damage core muscles, your brain shuts off those intrinsic muscles, go to, to the dynamic muscles, and you cannot provide good stability and good bracing. So as you can see, the FX is great on its own. The PL Touch is great it's on its own. Imagine it combination, the outcome that you'll be able to attain exponentially increasing your beneficial outcomes. So I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Gear. And here we go. Here we go. That was awesome, Dr. Silverman. Like I said, you get you get me fired up. I want to go back into the office right now to treat patients. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're still kind of shut down in here in Southern California with the whole crazy COVID thing and whatnot. Uh, so again, you see these same principles being applied, do movement. <clears throat> what I love about what uh, Dr. Silverman showed there too is how you can get one head of the laser or one laser on uh, on one area and another on the brain. That's fantastic to do. So that's one of the other benefits of having multiple lasers. I know if you're just getting started, you know, don't overwhelm yourself trying to think about getting everything right now. It's a building process. I know when I started in 2004, I started with the predecessor to the PL Touch, which was the PL5. Uh, and I started with that and I worked with it from 2004 until 2008. Like Dr. Silverman says, it's a workhouse, workhorse. The great thing you can do is how you can, you know, you got the two heads, so it's like having two lasers in, in one. Um, I used that for four years until I got really busy and I needed multiple lasers. Now, where does the advantage come? Let's say if you've got the base station, like Dr. Silverman showed the base station earlier, uh, his has two EVRLs, I mean, sorry, two accelerates and one EVRL. I do a lot of stuff with patients who have autoimmunity. There's a lot of chronic infections in there. So I, I, I selected mine to be with two violet uh, red combos and one accelerate. So you can do it however you like on there. The wonderful thing about that is then you can do multiple areas at the same time, just like he showed you with the core and the head at the same time, or you can do upper and lower extremity at the same time. We will oftentimes stack the FX with either of the handhelds at the same time. When I'm trying to see what I'm, what I'm going to, which laser I'm going to use is <clears throat> my go-to a lot is going to be the FF, FX if it's going to be like chronic high levels of pain in the neck or the low back. Like Dr. Silverman said, when I'm working with athletes, I always start with a handheld. And that would be either the Accelerate, the EVRL, or Appeal Touch. You can start with any of those because I want to activate their muscles to improve their sports performance. So if I have an athlete, when I get in a little later to what uh, we do with the shoulder, if I'm testing them for, for a throwing sport, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get any one of those handhelds on there. I'm going to test the muscles, finding what's weak, and then use a handheld while I'm having them activate the muscle to get that to, uh, to upregulate or what I like to call just for a 
a patient understanding thing. I like to call it to recalibrate. Um, I just use a different kind of term there because it makes a lot of sense to the patient, but it is technically just upregulation of that nervous system. Um, so you can stack those together. So what I want to get into here is headaches and trigeminal neuralgia. So we know that a lot of people have chronic headaches. <clears throat> we know that particularly if someone gets a concussion, which Dr. Silverman will talk about in just a bit, if they got a concussion, they had a recent car accident or sports injury collided with someone, headaches are very common. <clears throat> So what I usually will use with most of the headaches, I will usually go for one of the red lasers. Um, the reason for that, as Dr. Silverman talked about earlier, is you've got the red lasers that will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system to kind of calm everything down, whereas the violet laser can stimulate uh, the sympathetic nervous system. So anytime I've got a fresh headache, uh, I, I usually will try to get, if I'm going to use the EVRL, I'll use it more on the body because I just don't want to overstimulate the brain at that time. When we're dealing with headaches, too, you want to look at is it from a concussion, from an impact, which Dr. Rob will get into more. So I'm going to more talk about, let's say if it's just like migraine or cervicogenic headache, what am I going to do in that? Well, in a case like that, I am going to, first of all, I want to see if there's something I can do that can aggravate the pain. Is there a neck movement, forward, back, left or right, side to side? I do anvil tests, uh, you know, compression tests maximum foraminal compression, do any of those aggravated so I know if that's a factor there or not. I'm also going to palpate in the cervical spine. I'm going to see if when I palpate the suboccipitals, does that reproduce the pain? And if it, if it does, then I know I also want to work on those muscles there as well in the back of the neck. But when we're looking at a headache, here's the simple thing. What I like to do, even if it's a migraine, so um, I am a longtime migraine sufferer. Changing my diet helped a lot, but I still will sometimes get contaminated with MSG or gluten. And when I do, usually within about 20 minutes, I'll start to lose my vision. So I actually posted this on, on Facebook. If you guys friend me on Facebook, you can see this, to where I was driving to work one day, and I always have a laser with me. Uh, if my wife and I travel, we will have a laser with us as well. I'm driving along, and I start to get the little flutter here in the eye, and I know a migraine is coming. As I'm driving, it's getting bad enough. I actually had to pull off of the freeway because I was going to be, I, when I get them, I'll go almost totally blind in one or both of my eyes. And it started to kick in. So what did I do for a migraine? Well, it's very simple. I will start with some of those uh, neurological settings, the 4, 9, 33, and 60 is what I will usually go to. Like Dr. Silverman said, sometimes, especially if you have patients who come in a lot, you'll have to experiment and do some different types of settings because they can start to kind of adapt to it and it, it, it's not as effective as it used to be. It's kind of like going to the gym. If you do the same workout over and over and over again, your body gets adapted to it and it stops being as effective. So I like to switch up some different frequencies. So other times for migraine, I'll use four, nine, and instead of the 33 and 60, I'll use 160 and 6243. We can do that as well. When we look at frequencies like four, four has been shown in research studies to be a very good frequency for acute pain. 60 has been shown to be a very good frequency for chronic pain. So that's where those can be beneficial. So let's say that I've got a migraine patient in my office and I want to go with a handheld. I want to go either with the PL Touch or I want to go with the Accelerate on it. Let's say I'm doing just the Accelerate. Well, what I'm going to do, what I like to do is I can go um, two minutes on the temporal parietal lobe. You can go two minutes over the occipital, two minutes here on the opposite one. And then you can either go right over the frontal area here, or I really like going, and you can see uh, on my social media, I have a picture of myself when I had this migraine of doing this. Going right in to the open mouth and even getting up into the sinus cavities. And as Dr. Silverman mentioned earlier, the wonderful thing about the class two Erconia lasers, class two does not mean that it's weaker. Some of the, um, laser companies out there will try to misrepresent that to say that the higher class means it's better it's more effective no it's actually a risk factor so when you have a higher classification that is a higher classification of risk there are more side effects you have to wear safety goggles you can get thermal types of burns one of the things that 
they never talk about and i've gotten into debates online with people from uh these class four laser companies is i'll have them i'll bring up hey what about the research that shows with a class four thermal laser you can actually activate precancerous cells and that is a known potential side effect with those high powered lasers this is why you really want to use the class two ones because we don't have those side effects they're able to show in studies that specifically with dentistry if there are precancerous cells in the mouth and you laser that with a class four high powered laser, which means it is over 500 milliwatts up into the watts. Some of them are saying, oh, this is a 60 watt laser. It's the best laser out there. It's the fastest. Well, you can actually turn on these cancer cells and create, you know, a cancer proliferation in the mouth with that. You won't get it with a uh, with an arconia laser. And also because of the class two rating, that means that it's safe enough that even if you get flashed in the eye, it's generally recognized that your blink reflex will protect the retina, whereas with the high-powered lasers, it's recognized that that blink rev, uh, reflex is not sufficient and you can do retinal damage with it. And many times the practitioner has to wear goggles as well because the reflection of those higher-powered uh, photons can damage the retina as well. So little tangent there, but anyway, I like to get that right into the, right into the mouth. We'll do about two minutes. Now, this is where if you have a base station, it can be beneficial for you for time so this is why as you get busier you either want to get multiple lasers or you want to think about getting an fx uh, if it's the base station we can come in if i had two of the accelerates like dr rob has i can do two sides at once and then i can rotate and do the front and back <coughs> excuse me now i've cut that treatment time from eight minutes down to four minutes so we save some time there if you're using the PL touch, you can use two different heads at the same time like this and here. And again, if you don't have a stand, definitely get a stand so you don't have to stand there the whole time with it. If it's the FX, you can simply position this around here. You can position it into the Mohawk position. Perhaps Dr. Silverman can show you that even to where you can also have the patient lay down and you can do uh, where the central diode is going in the mouth and the two other diodes are on the side. It's as simple as that. Now, like what I like to do with the patients is I like to have them rate their pain before we get going, just like I talked about with the neck. Hey, what's your headache at right now on a scale of one to 10? We'll have migraine sufferers in a lot of times say, oh my God, it's a nine, it's a 10, or it's 11. This is even worse. And so what I usually do is I try to manage their expectations. I say, okay, what I'm gonna try to do with the laser right now is I'm gonna try to reduce that somewhere between 10 to 30%. Because usually when they're in the office, they're gonna be telling me, you know what, I've been popping every pill of medication, it is not touching it right now, what can you do? So even if I can get just a 10% reduction, they'll usually be pretty happy. What I will do sometimes even when I was first starting, I've done some headache protocols as simple as this, to where I've even just had it on the top of their head here, right on the very, very top there, and we'll do a countdown on there. I'll tell them usually within a minute, particularly with a migraine, we'll start to feel a decrease in pain. Now, why does that happen? Well, we got a few things that occur. So when we get the laser, say as I've got the laser here on my head, as I'm absorbing those photons, and you're gonna have naysayers in this that are going to try to say, well, how does that laser get through the cranium? Well, we know that even, um, you know, somewhere between one and 12% of the photons will directly penetrate through the cranium. And again, Dr. Silverman, I'm gonna set you up with a little softball here so you can talk about your article that I believe you wrote in uh, Dynamic Chiropractic talking about the impact that even just one or a few photons can have. When we're looking at this laser, is releasing billions of photons per second. So even if we block 90 or 99% of the photons, that's still millions of photons per second having an impact. Now, the other thing that occurs here is that when we get the laser on here, the laser is also known to stimulate something called mesenchymal stem cells. And there's a lot of these that are in the cranium. There's a recent study by Harvard that showed that there are these uh, tubules that directly connect the uh, the stem cells, basically the, the uh, marrow in the cranium with the surface of the brain. So as we have the laser on here and it's stimulating these mesenchymal stem cells, they can actually migrate from the uh, bone marrow to the surface of the brain to help with overall brain function. We're also going to get increased ATP. We're gonna get an increased production of endothelial and neuronal uh, nitric oxide, which will help to dilate the blood vessels, which helps with, with headaches. We're also going to get glutathione production and the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which again, helps with brain function. So we get a lot of things that are going on right there. So going back to what we're doing, I'll get the laser on there and usually within a minute, we'll see the patient starting to reduce their pain. What I do when people, doctors always ask me, how long do you do it for? Well, what I do is I will keep doing the laser as long as I see that 
pain level decreasing. Once I hit a plateau where sometimes let's say in the fifth, sixth or seventh minute, let's say they get from a 10 down to a three and it stays at the three for a minute, then I stop for that day. So, okay, we're good for today. Let's see how long that lasts. Now, if you wanna get fancy, and this particularly, I'm sure Dr. Silverman will talk about this on concussions, you can also do some different cranial nerve stimulation. You can have them do some following your uh, cardinal fields of gaze. If they're not too sensitive to light, you can do some pen light stimulation. Um, you can do some auditory stimulation as you're trying to kind of, you know, uh, recalibrate the nervous system, kind of calm it down. The key thing is you do some things there as long as it doesn't aggravate them. So you stimulate some different neural pathways, just like with the low back, you stimulate the legs or with the neck, you stimulate with movements. Here, when I do headaches, I like to stimulate some different pathways to see what can we do to activate different neural pathways in the brain to try to get them to fire better. With that, I'll ask them what's their, their history. Uh, let's say that they've got some problems, if it's a chronic type of a headache thing, and they say, you know what, I've got problems with word searching. I, I stammer for words. Well, then as I've got the laser here, I will have them go through the alphabet from A to Z and come up with words for each individual uh, letter, like A, apple, B, banana, C, cat. How long do we do that? Well, I do that until they start to fatigue a little bit. If they tell me, you know what, now I feel a little, a little wonky, um, I feel a little off, then we'll stop. So that's a simple way that we'll do that. When we're looking at trigeminal neuralgia, what I like to do here is, again, you can get it just over the area of involvement because remember, what are these lasers going to do? Well, they're going to help to dampen inflammation in that area. We know that inflammation is a factor a lot in nerve pain, and we're going to help improve the signaling of that nerve. Now, you could do two lasers if you want, or you can get it just right along this area where you would have the pain. I like to also provide some stimulation. So let's say if someone is really sensitive to touch, then I might take like a little pinwheel, pinwheel. And while I've got the laser on there, I'm gonna stimulate them. If they can barely handle it, I'll do it as light as possible. When I've had patients who are very, very sensitive, I might get a cotton swab and just stimulate them with a cotton swab. Or I might do my old orthopedic testing of, you know, uh, or neurological testing with the sharp and dull where you take a paper clip and you open it up so you have the pointy side and the rounded side. And I might stimulate along there and I might have them close their eyes. So that way they're just trying to pay attention to what they're feeling with their nerves and not with their eyes and get them to point things out. So again, I'll get the laser on the area of involvement. You can also get one over the, over the uh, base of the, of the spine or the occiput from to C1 and C2. And then I'll do little activations on there. You might also have them do some little mouth opening exercises, open and close jaw front and back, which you could also do if it was a TMJ case on there. So those are some basic, simple things that you can do. I'm going to turn that back over to Dr. Silverman now, and you can take the, the lob I gave you there. Oh, man, that was a beautiful lob. I think I dunked it for the first time in my life off a lob. That's awesome. <laughs> I, mean, I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, sure. So I want to recap a couple of things that we've been going over. Um, number one, I, I really want to make sure before we go any further that everybody understands how easy it is to apply. It is the laser is the most versatile, effective healthcare modality of the 21st century. It's sort of like the no pill pain buster. So if you're looking for pain, great question. It helps decrease the pain. It will without question do that. You know, uh, Dr. Kirk. Uh, mentioned, and um, I agree, we, I do a lot of functional medicine, and 35,000 foot view, after you integrate it in the musculoskeletal line, it's going to revolutionize and be quite transformative for nutrition and organs, but I don't want to go off the rails, I want to stay on it, so I have a couple things that I, I want to go over, and we've got a great preview and prelude to concussion now. So concussion without question is a conversation piece. Anything with the brain is taking it by storm. We've got concussion, we've got Alzheimer's, all these neurodegenerative topics that we can speak to. So I want to share with you a concussion protocol. Now, what I'll do with the concussion protocol is I also want to show you how you can use a couple of lasers at the same time. So everybody usually starts with one and they add and they add and they add. Dr. Year said he's got one, I got one, now we've got everything. And that's kind of how it happens as you learn uh, and get more comfortable with what the laser can provide for you, provide for your family, and provide for your patients. Now, my quick story why I purchased it, I don't know if you know or not, I have what they call congenital torticollis. 
So that was it. I got it at birth. And that's kind of like what drove me into chiropractic. So, you know, got teased a lot because, you know, where I grew up, if you didn't look like every other kid, it was that. And I guess, as you guys would say, um, I got into a few scrapes because of it. And that's all good. Now. Um, but I needed something 10, 12 years ago because adjustments were getting harder. I've got a calcified posterior particulum. If you saw my x-ray, you can see the fusion and everything like that, although my range of motion is really good. So it was recommended by a doctor or chiropractor that I had a lot of respect for to go get laser, and I did. And I started applying it to myself. And I thought, this is great. My range of motion's increased more. The pain has decreased. Let me try it on my friends and family. I did. And I got the outcome. And it got exciting. And it's the same way we do it with any kind of modality, any kind of treatment. My wife hates when I go to a seminar because I try everything on her. And, you know, sometimes you just don't have it right, like when you're with an adjustment or a soft tissue. So there's a little uh, discomfort with that. Having said all that, then I applied it to my practice and I'm here now. So I um, wanted to talk about concussion in that. Um, do you have the set up so you can sit? So I do a lot of concussion work, probably 50% of my practice, you wouldn't be here, 50% of my practice is gut to brain and brain right now, and it's growing. Um, and as you all know, I, I'm in the, um, I'm in my basin right now. So as Dr. Kirk had said uh, multiple times that there's a couple of different ways to put the FX. So I'm gonna start with the FX. So if you don't mind, have a seat. And while I'm here with the FX, I'm just going to apply it. So we get a little technical support here. So here we go. And bear with me. I don't want to, I want to just so you guys can you see that. There we go. And now you're seeing you get the FX. Now I'm deliberately not doing anything right now because I want to be able to talk to you. So in theory, I can work with her eyes. I can do some rehab. I can use another laser, which I'll show you in a minute, or I could go in the other room and treat somebody else. So I'm doing the FX right now. I wanted to share some really big takeaways, literature takeaways, while she's right here. Number one, the red light, which is what we're using, is innovative treatment for a wide range of neurological conditions. Um, it shows to enhance metabolic capacity of neurons, stimulate anti-inflammation, anti-cell death, antioxidant response, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis. That's an article from 2018. In an aging cell, October 2019, it's a decrease in amyloid production and a decrease in plaque formation. I've got a plethora of different studies right here, but I just wanted to talk about the idea that the laser stimulates BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Brain-derived neurotrophic factors are the ability to allow for a brain neurogenesis. Neurogenesis means that nerves are allowed to grow and the brain, which is plastic. So it's interesting in that brain neurogenesis is a positive outcome. It's really allowing these axons to connect and heal because if you can connect the axons, they can fire, they then work together. So again, the literature is really uh, stout in that it really talks about efficacious outcomes, all that laser improves neurological uh, performance. The big thing about the red laser and the 635 wavelength. Now, all the red lights are the same wavelength. They're 635. The only difference in the PL touch and the accelerate is that the PL touch has two heads. The accelerate doesn't. And the power is the same in the accelerate and the PL touch. This one's a little bit more powerful and it moves. Its field of motion is different. The big takeaway is 635 decreases the NF kappa B inflammatory pathway. So in essence, by decreasing NF kappa B, you're decreasing what they call now the very popular NLRP3 inflammasome. Therefore, you're not releasing all the interleukins. So you're getting a localized effect, but you're also getting a systemic effect. And that's the thing that people don't look at with the laser. All our FDA clearances, when you really look at them, you'll see a precipitous drop in pain after the end of treatment, a month later, six months later, or a year later. So you're getting tremendous, what I like to refer to as bang for the buck. In addition to that, there's one article in particular that I strongly recommend and I can send it to Simon. It's the Journal of Neuroscience Research and basically without question, it shows everything that you can do, shining the light on the head, photobiomodulation of brain disorders. So everything that a concussion does, damage to blood vessels, excitotoxicity, 
brain edema, damage to exons, damage to neurons, um, inability to have lymphatic drainages, this is able to reverse. So for me, the laser is the converse to the damage that's done in a concussion. So as Dr. Gear said, we can point it that way, that's temporal. And then if I turn it this way, I'm not gonna position it that way right now. And now we can do Mohawk. So I typically, this is my protocol. I do 10 minutes each way. I'm just gonna go back right here. And now I'm gonna show you how you can combine the treatments. So for me, I'm gonna use the EVRL. I'm gonna stand right here. And I'm gonna do what I like to refer to as a vagus nerve stimulation. So I'm simply going to get in here. I'm supposed to do what I say. I'm an, I prefer the violet light, okay, comfortable. And I'm just gonna go vagus nerve at the same time with the concussion. Vagus nerve, medulla oblongata down through the transverse colon. Medulla oblongata down through the transverse colon. It's your cranial nerve number 10, it's your great wanderer. This vagus nerve is a critical element to overall communication, bi-directional communication with the gut and brain and brain and gut. So the, it's a little hard, there's the violet on my shirt. It depends on the shirt if you'll be able to see it, but you can see it against her skin. Now, some of the practitioners do, and Simon and I had this conversation, do like the violet and the red together, so be it, but the violet has to be part of the whole dynamic to get your outcome with vagus nerve stimulation. So you can also do that, and Dr. Kirk was talking about, they can go up her nose, she can open her mouth, don't worry, boom, get the heart and the soft palate. The reason you get the heart and the soft palates is you're trying to stimulate and get that cerebral spinal fluid moving. So you can do a combination of treatments. Now, in addition, one more thing before I send it back is, and I didn't, I didn't do hip, but I think we'll get to hip on the next time, is that you can also laser the gut because whatever you do to your brain, you do to your gut, whatever you do to your gut, you do to your brain. So I just wanted to take this time to show you concussion. Um, I also wanted to show you multiple lasers. And if you don't mind sitting right there one second, if you only have a handheld, and since I'm trying to fit to the PL touch, it gives you the opportunity, you can either put the lasers together, when I say the lasers, the heads, you can heat each low individually if you'd like, or you can split them and do two at a time. So I'm going to head back to Dr. Kirk, and then I know we're going to ask, answer, if you will, some questions. Uh, let me get that. All right, great, Dr. Silverman. That was fantastic. I love how you went over the vagus nerve and uh, doctors, that's really important to look at, you know, a, a good idea of how you know you need to do that vagus nerve in the patient is if you've got a patient that comes into your office and if you do any nutritional therapies and um, you talk to them about taking some supplements, if they tell you, oh doc, I can't swallow pills, I need something in a liquid or a powder, you need to do that vagus nerve exercise with them, uh, just like he showed, and you will see you'll get some patients who had trouble swallowing pills uh, be able to, to swallow them because you change that function. As you mentioned, the bi-directional pathway, you get that better and everything starts to improve. There is nobody else really who's uh, addressing these types of factors with patients, and you will hit a lot of what we call in the U.S. home runs. You'll, you'll do a lot of amazing things with these, uh, with these patients if you do that. So the last portion that I'm going to be demonstrating here is just going to be the shoulder, because when I think of extremities, my two favorite things to work on with athletes with the laser is I love shoulders and I love knees because I can get big, big results. It's something that tends to not be treated very well by other practitioners, and uh, I, can, I can make a huge difference very, very quickly. So how do we treat this? What do we do? Well, let's say you have an athlete coming in like uh, well, i have a lot of baseball players who come in so for you guys it might be cricket you know or uh, other types of throwing sports that you guys have um if i have an athlete coming in and they've got a, a problem let's say that they they can't throw the ball anymore because they have a lot of pain um or it's not uh it, it's not got the same velocity on it or let's say it's not even an athlete let's say it's a worker who has to do repeated lifting and they're like ah, i can't lift very well anymore well what i'm going to do in that type of a case is this I'm going to start off by, you can do 
your imaging, you know, MRIs, see how damaged it is. Um, you can do orthopedic testing. But regardless of how bad it is, uh, I, I, even if I've had patients with multiple tears, I'm still going to get a laser on them because I have one particular case study where I had a patient who he works for Cacique Cheese out here in California. He is their main refrigeration expert and he was lifting a heavy refrigeration um, device and he felt a pop in his shoulder heard it as well came in couldn't lift his arm at all we did an mri he had uh three large tears in his shoulder so we were thinking at that time of using the laser for pre-op and the cool thing is your your lasers they have pre-programmed settings in there for pre-op and post-op they are cleared there's actually research studies showing that they can accelerate healing before and after surgery as well too because you're stimulating uh, stem cell proliferation you're stimulating atp glutathione all these different things that help to the tissue to repair faster with the surgery well with him we actually got such an improvement that the surgeon canceled the surgery because he got full range of motion and strength within about eight weeks from not being able to lift it up at all how did we do it so whether it's a someone who's just got chronic aches or pains or if it's a major strain we're going to go through the same thing where this is going to be more difficult is if you have a patient with a frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis that one does take longer so we get that question asked a lot in that case if it's frozen shoulder i do like to go with the evrl quite a bit because of the way it helps with that chronic scar scar tissue if it's a chronic shoulder one i like to use the settings of 8 25 42 and 279 the 279 is what it is for a chronic injury when i have an acute injury i will do the same settings except we'll switch out that 279 i'll do 8 25 42 and 125 so how do i do it <clears throat> if it's an athlete i'll have them go through the motion that causes them pain so if they're a throwing athlete i'll have them try to throw the ball like this and have them tell me how much um, pain do they have while they try to throw that. If it's a worker, I'll have them replicate, is it with lifting motions? How much pain do they get with trying to lift it? Then what I do is I'll see how far can they bring it up in this direction? How far can they bring it in that direction? You can easily go, um, you can easily go onto the shoulder area. I always try to get the laser directly on skin whenever possible now can laser go through clothing clothing yes and i'll let dr rob if you want to if you want to address that because you wrote a great article on that i'll let i'll let you take that one afterwards um i like to get on here because i'm always looking at patient perception so i don't i try to minimize them from asking any any questions saying well you know hey is that not going to go through clothing and if they go online they can find a video from jan tuner where he's trying to say laser doesn't penetrate clothing yet he's got a watt meter on there that shows laser actually going through the textiles that he's testing so he's actually proving himself wrong because there are still photons going through. Um, but I'll let Dr. Silverman, I'll let you kind of talk about that. Anyway, I try to get on the skin. You will get more absorption when it's on the skin, also just for patient perception. Now, when I have a patient who's been with me for a long time and they're used to it, I, I don't always do that. I'll do like how Dr. Silverman demonstrated earlier where we'll go through the clothing. If I have a patient who's in a dress for modesty's sake i'm not going to make them take the dress off i'll still just get it on that area but i like to try to get it here what you can do simply is click it into a stand if you have the fx you can just surround the area and you know what you can do you can simply just have the patient do ranges of motion while the laser's on there i can have them come up and do that uh, abduction movement now if they get pain right here then I'm only going to have them go just up to below the point of pain. Now, guess what's gonna happen as we have that laser going on for that time? Gradually, it's gonna increase and that's where their eyes are gonna get bigger and they're going, oh my God, when I first started, I can only go to here. And now in this one session, I'm up to there. I might also have them do coming up to the front, uh, doing their forward flexion as well. Now, what I also like to do though, is I like to do some resistant muscle testing. So. I might have them come up to this direction and I'm gonna have them push up against my resistance. How hard am I gonna push against them? Just do what they tolerate. I don't wanna increase their pain, but I want them to activate the muscle. So I had the patient come in with the tears. When we would test his arm, he would barely activate it. No real pressure against it, but I wanted to activate that muscle. We would do it repeatedly until he said, okay, I'm fatigued or I've got some increased soreness. We would have him come up in this direction too. I might test his biceps. Uh, I might test also his triceps. We'll go through all of those different standard hop and fill muscle tests. 
And that's what we'll do, as simple as that. Now, you can also, while that laser, whether it's the FX or uh, the EVRL or, or the uh, Accelerate or the PL Touch, while it's on there, you can also then stack it and get in with an Arconia Precussor, find areas where you might have some trigger points and use that Precussor to release it. I also like to, while I've got, when we're doing extremities, I'll get one over that area of involvement and then I'll get a second laser if you have it over the nerve roots. We'll do that. So what I might do in this case is I over the nerve roots would I usually will use either 4, 9, 33, and 60 or 9, 16, 42, and 53 over the nerve roots. Uh, if you have the PL touch, that's going to be in your pre-programmed head. So you can take the PL touch, get it over the uh, uh, cervical spine. And then over the area of involvement, that's where I'm going to either do the acute injury settings for a, few, for, uh, for a recent one of 8, 25, 42, and 125. Or if it's a chronic one, an old injury, old surgery that didn't heal properly, or adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, I'll do 8, 25, 42, and 279. So those are my basic ones we'll do there. Dr. Silverman, I want to turn that back over to you for a second. Let's get you on here as well. So if you want to address uh, anything about the, the clothing issue, that'd be great. Yeah, the clothing, you know, you spoke to an article that I wrote about and we got some flack, but that's not for, for now to discuss. Uh, okay. So, uh, but we'll definitely talk about it after because you'll have a great time with it. Um, just so everybody knows, all the FAA clearances were done for clothes. As Dr. Gear said, it's better on skin. There'll be instances yeah where patients won't show a skin. There's a scatter. 40 to 45 billion photons being shot out of the laser. Now that you know 40 to 45 billion, the scatter is up about 90%. Laser works very simply. The body works absorbing one photon. It's called the power of one. As long as you get the one photon in, it gets the whole cascade going. It's just one match. One match lights and the whole Christmas tree lights up. So the scatter doesn't mean as much as people think, but it's not as adverse as people think. Now, the best way that we, we describe it all the same way, there's a barbed wire fence, fence, there's some sand, we throw it through the fence. Believe me, if you're standing there without goggles, you will get some morsels of sand, even a scintilla, and it will cause the reaction that you're looking for. So yes, the goes through thin clothes, it is always better on skin. It's really your choice of how you wanna approach it in your practice. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation. And I, I like to share when I teach my two day seminar, I talk about this um, documentary that's on Netflix. Have you seen it, Dr. Rob? The uh, the Iceman Cometh? Yes, yeah. So I love talking about this. Uh, Richard Kukulinski. And for you guys, if you haven't seen it, he was a mob hitman. And his favorite way to kill people um, was with cyanide. And he talked about how he'd either spill a little on their wrist, sprinkle it on their food or in their drink. And it didn't take very much. And what would happen is within a few minutes, he said he could see the light go out in their eyes. Now, why do we bring this out related to lasers is that cyanide works by affecting the electron transport chain and preventing it from being able to make ATP. And you can get a little bit on your skin here and it creates this global effect that now causes the heart muscles to stop because you can't make any more ATP. So laser is like the yin yang, it's like the good guy compared to that. So where we get it on it, even if you get it on the extremity, it's gonna go globally. There are studies by Mitrofanis and Oron talking about you get laser on the tibia and on the leg, and it actually ch changed function in the brain for, for mice and rats, being able to have better spatial awareness and a better cognitive function. So it's important for you guys who are new to laser to understand that. And also as Dr. Silverman brought up the FDA clearances for these lasers, 18 of the 21 are with class two lasers, specifically with the Arconia lasers. They are the ones who actually did the level one studies. So you've got some other, a lot of lasers that don't have any research on them, or they don't have really clearances beyond just topical heating. So it's a completely different thing and uh, in how it's being used and what is the research supporting how it is being used and what it can do. Absolutely. And I know Simon's got some questions, but before I got a big shout out to my man, Max. He's one of the first guys with EVRL. And I hear as a chiropractor, he's the first one getting the FX. Now, Max, I want to tell you something. You can take that FX 635 and run with it. You can take that FX 635 and add that EVRL, and you're going to get the full composite laser healthcare system in your office. So when I come out there, when all this nuts 
stuff is gone and whatever you want to call it, you're going to get to treat me with both of those. And I know that we have some questions because Simon um, was letting us know. So Sai, what do you got for us? We're ready to go. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, fellas. That was for Ameri my American guests. That means gentlemen. We have those little idiosyncrasies in the UK and Europe. Um, yeah, there's a one <clears throat> specific to the, the recommended frequencies for each condition. Um, you know, you guys in the US are a lot more experienced with the lasers than we are in Europe. So what we try to do is we try to set our new customers up with a core set of laser frequencies because we don't want to overcomplicate it. As time goes on, we will go in more in depth into more advanced settings or other things that you can do. But I also think maybe you guys will reiterate this point that it's important not to get too transfixed on what hertz settings we use for this, what hertz settings we use for that, etc. Yeah, definitely, because you can get the uh, analysis of paralysis. I know that kind of happened to me a bit when I first got my laser in 2004. And I got Dr. Veruca's manual, which is wonderful, absolutely fantastic manual. But you look through it, and you can get, oh my God, I'm I'm so overwhelmed. What do I do for this and that? And then you can pull back and say, well, I, I don't know enough about the frequencies. Uh, I'm going to go back to an example from from music with me being a musician. There's this really fun video you guys should check out on YouTube. It's by the Axis of Awesome, and it's called Four Chords. And so in this video, they show how majority of all the biggest selling hits worldwide use the same four chords because it triggers a response in our body and in our brain and it's this pattern that whether it's journeys don't stop believing or u two's with or without you or pachelbel's canon in d or uh auld lang sign or all these different songs they use the identical four chords in them because for some reason our body responds to those specific frequencies and it gives you this feeling of being uplifted and looking forward to the future etc it's the same thing with the lasers let's keep it simple so i like to um there's something called the pareto principle where the 80 20 rule we look at income to where you know there's like 99 percent of the income is held by one percent of the people etc or if we look at the carpet in your office 80 percent of the wear is on 20 percent of the carpet uh your patients you're going to have 80% of your referrals come from 20% of your patients. Same thing when we look at these frequencies. You can take like four, five, 10 frequencies and you can spend majority of your day in those ones. Like what, what my usually find, I'm spending mostly in the four, nine, 33, and 60. I do that a lot. I do the nine, 16, 42, and 53. I do the acute scar tissue, uh, the acute injury one and the scar tissue one majority of the time those four are my big go-to's and then we'll add in like the discogenic pain one the 916 5000 and 10,000 those are the ones I use most frequently uh, so I'm not having to memorize a ton I have them pre-programmed remember in your lasers you can pre-program them but you can do a ton with those frequencies so don't over complicated think of that 80 20 rule you're going to affect 80 percent of the people with maybe 20 percent of the frequencies that are in that book anything you want to add there dr rob yeah i'm i'm, I'm just going to wrap it up in a nice tight ball you did a great job um yes just so you know i don't use a lot of frequencies either i think that too many practitioners get lost and to speak to what you said you can load the laser so the laser is the gun the bullets are set to go. You put the frequencies in, you're in a gunfight. Don't stop and check to see if you have bullets. You will be too slow to shoot. Having said all of that, I do switch to frequencies, but I use it's right. He's got, you have 40 frequencies, so it's ready to go. Don't let that stop you. The frequency is the period on a sentence and the frequency helps at clinical plateau. The key component or the key components are wavelength, power and the fact it's a coherent light and the frequency is the icing on the cake but that doesn't mean you shouldn't get dr jerome's book just like dr gear we're there we don't use that many frequencies they're there for reference and the fact is i've had people that have had lasers for 10 years that haven't used up to the 40 that they've already um <laughs> they've already programmed no look at mine i've only got this is mine I've had this laser for two years when I traded into my, uh, where I sold my old base station, got this one. I've only got 14 frequencies preloaded in there. That's, that's it. I've never come close to loading all 40 on there. Yeah. And the truth is with the accelerate, it comes with eight. 
I only use a few more after that. So, yeah. and it's not that I see the same kind of patient every time, but again, we don't want to belabor this frequency point because we go over it a lot in seminars. Frequency is there. It's great that you have it. And again, one little takeaway, acute, lower frequency, chronic, little higher frequency. The real question is timing. How long do you want to do per condition and stuff like that? So um, I think we put that frequency question to bed, but we get that every time. If I can add in yeah. one thing real quick too, while we're here showing this, let me show you guys something here too. I would make sure when you get in here, uh, when I'm in the office, that protocol audio beep, I like to keep that thing on uh, just for Pavlov's dogs kind of rule on there because patients expect medical devices to make noise. When I'm at home, it drives my wife nuts. So she said, will you turn that dang beeping off but in the office i always have it on so that way the patients know they can hear it they know that the laser is on just a little thing i like I, that i found kind of works do you do the same thing dr Silverman? i actually keep it on in the office uh, off at home because that's the and i think that's the one thing that we, we need to tackle is the patients 19 out of 20 patients won't feel it because it's energy so your energy right. your tai chi your yoga your um dancers their energy i'm a basketball guy i had a touch and feel because we could touch you at the time put our hands on you you play football you got to touch so they yeah. don't feel the energy that's why the key to laser success is what we both were trying to show in baseline assess apply treat and then reassess and that's the sweet spot if you do that your practice will blossom i'm getting emails now during covid 19 what can we do when can we get back in when can you get the laser with advertisement my patients are my advertisement because of the laser success so yes i mean i don't know what else to say other than that i mean i always try to figure out what was the best practice management i found out that patient outcome became the best practice management yeah, definitely. And then also when you have the FX and these other things, I find that anytime patients are under in my office, they're like this. They're shooting pictures of themselves and they're posting it up on all of their social media. And then their friends see it and they're like, oh my God, what is that? That looks so cool. I want to come in because people ask, well, what, what if I just get an LED device? You know, I, and the LEDs, they're not going to work as well in those FDA clearance studies. LEDs were the placebo device, so they didn't work as well. They don't look as good either. But when you've got a beautiful piece of equipment like that, not only does it work better, but patient perception is huge. They love to picture themselves under and say, look, I've got the coolest doctor around. They've got the coolest gadgets. And it just generates a lot of referrals for you. You know what? And, and I know Simon wants to chime in, but I got to say one more thing. <laughs> You're excited and I'm excited. And, and we've been using, I've been doing this for 12 years. You've been using it for 16 years. Do you remember the day you got it? I remember I was like, just shaking. I was so excited. Yeah. That Absolutely. excitement resonates with your patients. It does. You know, so often I've gone to the doctor and he looked at me and he goes, oh, here's another number. When you have that laser, you're going to be excited because it's your new toy. You're doing yep. it on yourself. That patient is excited because you have everything. You do the same thing all the time at a certain point. For some reason, we're humans. It looks stale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you said, the patients are excited. I get it to where they're like, oh, I, I know Dr. Gare's going to fix me. If he can't fix me, nobody's going to be able to do it, especially with athletes. And you don't want to tell them it's not you or me, it's that laser that we're pressing. So guys, just remember, if I do it or he does it at a seminar and as an outcome, don't think we got a special thumb. That laser is universal and it's the great equalizer and stabilizer. Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah, that's a good point, guys. But I think <clears throat> also, you know, it, it fits in so well around your standard chiropractic techniques. So it, it's never just a case of we will just use the laser. If the patient's in so much pain that they can't even be touched, that's also the beauty of it because you don't have to touch the patient. But, you know, I think you demonstrated uh, earlier, both of you, that um, using the laser isn't replacing what you're doing. It's just enhancing what you're doing. Well said. Brilliant. Um, there's another question here from Sasha, which I'm not quite sure exactly what it means. Um, how do the FDA equivalent standards compare in? And then there's nothing after that. So I'm not quite sure. I'll just, I just I'll jump on that one. The, the FDA is a standard bearer of what we do where we are. And um, with 18 out of 21, there's a little bit of a separation between us and all the other companies. And that FDA definitely does. But one, it shows that the company's willing to do research. Two, the company's willing to put money down you know it's very funny you get one and you walk away 
So for me, I tip my hat to Aconia because they got one and they did it again and they keep mm -hmm. doing it. It's like Michael Jordan, two wasn't mm -hmm. enough, three wasn't enough, six was the number. And mm -hmm. hence the idea that that's why he's the GOAT. And my, mm -hmm. my hat's off to them because they could have stayed at one, two, three or four and been ahead. Nope, they kept going for the jugular. That's great, thanks guys. Um, let's have a look at some more questions. Can you please, oh, here's another one for migraines, but can you please give the settings for migraines again? I mean, we can easily provide that. Okay. Yeah, I can give uh, it to you. Basic ones, four, nine, 160, and 6243. That's straight out of Dr. Ruruka's manual. That's what, what I use on it. Okay, another one here. Is it possible to overuse the lasers? Go ahead, Rob, you wanna take that one? Uh, I laugh because, um, the truth is, the answer is no, yes, because you need to do something else during the day. And I'm not trying to be funny when I say that. So there's some literature that say possibly over an hour. You're not going to laser anyone over an hour. So what I tell everybody is an hour or less, don't sweat it. Yeah, same, same thing. And especially with these being, you know, class two lasers, you don't have that worry. If it's a class four, absolutely, because you go high, you get that horm hormetic type of a response, and now you can actually trigger tissue damage. And there are studies that show it. There's one particular one that compared low level lasers versus high intensity lasers for sports performance. And they found that while the low level laser increased muscle mass and endurance and recovery, et cetera, they found that the high powered laser created more muscle damage, that they had an elevation in creatine kinase and there was more inflammation that occurred with it. But that's again, that's what, if we're really gonna high power on there. And I just like to kind of tie it in that way because you will have some people that say, oh, we can come with this high powered device and we can deliver the same amount of energy that would take 10 minutes for an Arconia laser. We can do it in 30 seconds. Well, an analogy there is if you take a nice steak and you, you slow cook it, versus you put it in a microwave for 30 seconds, you might have delivered the same energy in there, but that steak or those ribs or whatever are not the same at all because there's a difference in that rate of delivery, how it changes the way the tissue is responding. So with absolutely with those kind of high powered, there can be an issue with your coney ones, like Dr. Silverman said, you're, you're, you're gonna be fine with what you're doing. The main thing is that from a patient management standpoint and office procedure standpoint, you will get patients who come in who get a great result in 10 or 20 minutes, and now they wanna get half an hour or an hour, it, it's not really practical for you to do that. So that's what I just share with the patients. Listen, we, we wanna find that sweet spot, kind of like with exercise. Um, we wanna to go to right where enough gives you a great response. And if we keep going longer, it's not necessarily that's gonna harm you, but are we gonna get that much more of a, of a better response than we already got at 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes? Yeah, more isn't always better. And that's a great point. And again, we're not generating heat. Mm -hmm. So let's get these basic ideas. I, th I think this needs to be um, discussed just a little bit sure. in that the lasers that are photothermal generate heat. Now, you don't want to heat an acute condition. We all know that. You don't want to heat a nerve. You definitely don't want to heat a brain. The only argument anybody has is you want to heat a chronic condition. However, if you follow the newer literature, the condition is chronic in duration, but it's actually acute every day chronic in duration, acute every day. And if that's the case, you never really want to use heat. Not saying that heat doesn't have its place, but when you have that option, you definitely don't want to heat. You want photochemical. And when you know that it's working with the body's own healing mechanisms, cellular mechanisms, ATP, oxygenation, and neurotransmission, no pun intended, it's a true no-brainer. Right. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, that's well explained. Uh, well explained, guys. I mean, we always say across here that you know, I mean, the laser is just a delivery mechanism of getting energy into the body so that the body can actually do what it's supposed to do in the first place. Great. Well said. Um, settings for vagus nerve. Um, okay, so I happen to use the violet light, so I use just the acne settings. Okay. Everybody does it a little differently now. Everybody does it a little different. I also use the Ebrael. Um, I many times will use just the... Uh, I kind of learned this from Dr. Spencer. I'll use 916, 916 is what I'll what I use on there. Uh, one of the fantastic things too about when you're using that violet laser on the vagus nerve is you get that antimicrobial effect. We know the bugs crawl up from the gut into the brain, set up inflammation there, and can trigger neurodegeneration. So that's where you get a really huge, huge benefit to 
with uh, supporting the um, supporting the vagus nerve and the gut. I think Dr. Silverman, when you talked about using over the gut, absolutely fantastic to do that because you can affect the microbiome, uh, you know, just in positive ways. There's not enough that can be said. You could do a whole one hour just on the violet laser and the and the vagus nerve and the gut. So the big thing with the vagus nerve and, and stimulating is is great concept about about the bugs. But you have to remember, even if we just talk COVID-19, because that's at the tip of everybody's mind, there's something called yeah. viral shedding. So you're shedding the virus through your poop, your gut, um, for the first five days and 28 days after the abatement of fever. So you imagine your ability to make outcomes now, gut outcomes, since 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. I know we don't want to divert too much to that, but the, the concept of being able to stimulate the vagus nerve is very potent and powerful. This is as good a way as I've ever seen. And without question, it's got chiropractic written all over it. Well said. It's brilliant, thanks guys. Um, there's one from Bruno in Spain who I know has an FX 635. Actually, it's not a question. It's just saying the protocol of working on the head with the laser is fantastic. I have put this into practice with some of my patients with great results. So thanks guys. Great to hear. Hey, by the way, one little addition, because I know, I know, I know we're running a little late, but every one of the speakers that are kind of use, utilizes, whether it's over the pond or on this side of the pond, we all do it a little differently. The one mm -hmm. thing that we use is the laser. So don't get hung up. Press mm -hmm. play, press mm -hmm. power, go to work. Yeah, let the laser do the yeah, magic. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, in case of stimulating vagus nerve for stress, is there a recommended treatment time? So the way I approach the vagus nerve is real simple. I do 30 seconds on each side. Um, I found that to be most effective. There's some other advanced ones now. Uh, maybe we'll do an advanced vagus. I know I have an advanced seminar coming up in America. So there's some other things where we talk about the auricular branch and all this other stuff. But to answer your question, 30 seconds or less, which is usually three or five passes, that's how I do it. And I do it via heart rate variability. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. I'll do basically the same thing. I might just add in a vagus nerve exercise while they're doing it, particularly as I brought up that patient who has difficult if they have difficulty swallowing. I'll have them just gargle while we're activating. Again, I just like to activate the pathway while doing it. But it's basically about the same amount of time, like Dr. Rob says. Right. Thanks, guys. Um, can laser therapy help with ME sufferers with chronic fatigue and severe muscle aches and back pain? We're looking at each other because ME, you must be using a different. Can you find out what they mean? I yeah, can look at that puzzle. Yeah, I, I got the little. Guys, little um, it's, it's, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, what that means, we're sorry. Yeah. It's my allergic infromyelitis. I haven't used it on that condition. I, don't I, know. I haven't either. So I'm going to, thanks, thanks, Doc. We're going to, yeah. I'm going to pass on that one. I, I, I haven't either. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm stumped on that one. So I don't want to. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you, just before he goes, Rob, Rob Sullivan, have you used it on that at all? Uh, we do. Um, in fact, I had a patient uh, Saturday, last Saturday. Uh, we treat with it. And I suppose it's partly these two guys' fault that I treat it the way that I do. Um, I use uh, the Vegas settings that Kirk has on the Vegas nerve for it. And for some strange reason, I actually use the chronic settings there that uh, Robert gave. And we basically treat the brain, vagus nerve. We go to the brain centers related to sleep patterns and circadian rhythms. And we actually then do the diaphragmatic area. Um, the reason I do that is I read an article on PubMed uh, about treatments in this where they were using precursors and electrotherapy. So I thought, right, let's use a laser instead, see what happens. And mm -hmm. it gets results. Awesome. Awesome. I was just looking yeah. up the article. That's, <laughs> that's one of the great things too, though, is like when you when you understand what the laser is doing on this photobiochemical level, really there's no limits to what you can't help with a laser. Because when you're when you're dampening inflammation, as Dr. Rob talked about, IL six, you know, and cytokine storms. When you're stimulating stem cells, you're stimulating ATP, uh, nitric oxide, glutathione, all these different things. 
what condition doesn't benefit for that? Now, that doesn't mean that we have research on all these conditions or that it's FDA cleared for that. But realistically, like I have one patient who came in with a pulmonary hypertension who'd been on between a quarter of a million and almost half a million dollars of medications every year for the last eight years. And she was at her wit's end and asked me, hey, can you help with this? I'm like, I don't know. I've never worked on it, but let's get the laser. Let the laser do the magic. And we did. And she got off of, a, off of her oxygen tank and her pulse oxygenation was better within uh, within a few weeks. So you see, you can see some amazing things. So, you know, I, I always, I'll, I'll give it a shot when a person's on their, on their last, you know, last hope, the Obi-Wan Kenobi moment, them coming in and saying, help us Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. Um, we'll give it a shot as long as they understand, hey, we're in uncharted territory. You tell me if you think this is working or not. You know, as long as there's no major contraindications, I'll, I'll use a laser for a lot of different things. Yeah, great. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Kip. And, 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 sorry, Rob, I know there's different um, uh, understanding, different side of the pond. I was looking at ME, same as chronic fatigue syndrome. So um, um, across here, it's either chronic yeah, fatigue sy yeah, syndrome or ME. Absolutely. So I, I like what Dr. Sullivan did there in that, um, yeah, and, and I don't want to belabor it. So I'm going to one, not one up for you, I'm going to add to it. So without question, vagus nerve. For me, most of the fatigue comes in the gut. I'm a big gut guy, so I would laser the gut. Now, if you've got a red light, that's great. If you've got the EVRL, even better. In addition to that, we both probably didn't talk enough about it, but I know it's in an upcoming webinar about its positive effect on mitochondria. So obviously it may, you know, it's very efficient ATP production. In addition to that, and this is thought provoking, so I may get you guys in on this and this may be too far. Remember, if it's blocking the NF kappa B and it, it's blocking the NF kappa B through that NLRP3 inflammasome, part of that NLRP3 inflammasome is inefficient mitochondria. So could we theorize that because what it's doing to the cell, that toll-like receptor, is actually allowing the mitochondria to be enriched with energy? something to be discussed in the mitochondrial stuff. And I think Dr. Sullivan, I think the three of us should get on that one time because when people see what it does at the mitochondrial level, you're the cell energy expert guy. Hmm. I mean, guys, you will be stronger. So I'll take my wife and the young lady was my wife because obviously we're in pseudo quarantine and she can do 20 push-ups, not modified. So if I laser her, she can do 30. And, you know, I told her the day she can't do 25 is the day that, you know, she's out. It's a joke in any case. But the point being that enriches the muscle with energy to perform better. And I think yeah, we should. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's just amazing what you can do performance wise because of what you do with the stimulating the mitochondria. I was actually in a something called the mitochondrial summit where I talked about how lasers impact the mitochondria. I know for myself at 50, like I went to, a, uh, they had an event in my high school for all of the past football stars for many decades and I'm standing by a fence that's like six and a half feet high and all these guys are walking way down like about a hundred yards to go through a gate and I asked the coach hey you got a you got a key to open this one he's like no you got to walk down there I said screw it I just hopped the fence right there and just kind of flipped over it and jumped down and these guys that were younger were like how the hell did you do that how'd you scale that fence so quickly I'm like I use lasers. You know, lasers are like the fountain of youth there. And uh, yeah, when it comes to like chronic fatigue, we'll all use that. A lot of them have thyroid issues on top of it. So I'll even use the laser around the thyroid and also transcranially because most of those chronic fatigue patients have brain fog as well. So we'll I'll address that too. Brain, okay, mitochondria, number one source. We could be here all day on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot of questions here as well. So we'll try and get through as many as we can. Sure. Um, have they noticed any changes with laser for nerve root compressions, i.e. neurological deficits? Good question. You want to take it, Rob? Sure. That look, compressed by what? So let, so I, I talked about a neural dynamic test, a neural tension test. So if it's in cr compressed or in an adhesion where the nerve doesn't glide and slide, it works fabulously. If it's where it exudates on the nerve, I always call it the frosted flakes. When you move the nerve, you shake off the frosted flakes, great. If it's a structural compression, which isn't as common. So we'll say in the um, inguinal canal, it will still work. It'll work a little slower. Now, there's also a concept, concept that Cairo say, it's pinching the nerve. And it's not an incorrect, but it's more, it's a chemical irritant to the nerve. 
And that's what we realized. Now on the co concept of chemical irritant, that was one thing that I always like to make very important and really bring out to the forefront in that chemically, this laser is stellar for biochemical resolution. So you've got those ideas. And if it's physical compression, as long as it's not a crush, you're going to get great outcomes because most of the time the pressure is from an adhesion and or a chemical irritation. Those things are going to resolve quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen the same thing, you know, as long as there's not like a, you say a major crush or if I've had a, there's a really large osteophyte that's just, you know, really compressing there. That's where I have a more challenging one where I'll, although we've had ones where we did get good results, I usually will just take that and tell the patient, listen, yours is going to be a little more challenging. Um, you're talking about inflammation, so we know the laser can dampen inflammation. I make sure also we stack some nutritional things on top. I know Dr. Silverman is an expert in that and does, does the same thing. So that's important because I want to make sure that patients understand that while we can do some amazing things with the laser, with putting out fires of inflammation, we don't want them going home and pouring gasoline all over it again by eating a, a bad diet as well. But we see a lot of conditions where we've had enough of them um, cancel surgeries that I have an orthopedic doctor in my town who forbids his patients to see me when they have a surgery scheduled because he's had too many cancel it and he's missed out on some really big paydays which you guys may not understand how big the paydays are since you have you know a, a, a socialized medicine but here like I had one particular patient who had major disc uh, herniations in his neck and had a previous spinal fusion his surgeon ended up canceling the surgeon because he made so much progress with the lasers and he actually told the patient well i got good news and bad news the good news is for you you don't need the surgery the bad news is for me as a doctor that i was going to make eighty thousand dollars off of this one surgery so you can see why some of the orthos don't necessarily uh like what we're doing in uh, preventing patients from needing surgeries you must right, be the next question must be sorry sir. i know also sorry Sai. <laughs> that's okay <laughs> Just you guys are so popular, we're getting so many questions. I just want to try to get through as many as we can. Uh, really? I read in Japanese, in a Japanese study, they used laser on carotid artery and that had an effect on women's fertility. I found it interesting as I work in fertility. And actually this is a lady who's just purchased the EVRL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some stuff like that as well, too. When we look at like the carotid artery or we look at anything vascular, we know that one of the things that the lasers do is it stimulates vascular endothelial growth factor. So we know that can, uh, like in my patient with the pulmonary hypertension, uh, that can actually help to repair and improve uh, uh, you know, blood flow. I've seen some of those studies as well. So I, I actually have had patients come in and we've used the, like I'll use the FX and I'll place it around the abdomen on some general support settings. This is one of these less than one percent of people come in for this i mean this may be like one tenth or one hundredth or one percent and we'll use some of the settings from uh, raruka's manual for like ovary and uterus etc and we had some people who were having trouble with pregnancy where it actually helped them and with their fertility so yeah i have seen that i've seen some of the studies too for males where using the laser can actually stimulate testosterone production uh there's also an interesting one showing that using uh, sound and light at 528 hertz on the brain stimulating stimulated testosterone production as well too so kind of interesting things there's i haven't seen a ton of research have you dr rob i haven't seen a lot but i have used it in that manner yeah, I haven't seen a lot on that either uh, with the carotid artery. As far as fertility, what I'm finding in my office is the blood sugar. I mean, they're fertility experts. But again, the EVRL does a really good job in the balance of the autonomic nervous system. And we weren't able to get to that. So right. one works with parasympathetic, one works with sympathetic. When the systems are in sync, the immune system's working well. The autonomic systems are working well. The immune system works with the nervous system. When your systems are working well, you're more proficient at any of your bodily functions. So that's all I can really add to that. Perfect. No, I agree completely. Um, there's a question from Laurie. Uh, are there any, well, it's quite a short question really to be fair. Are there ever negative reactions to laser use? This is where we need to differentiate also between true non-thermal low level laser and other classifications of laser as well. Yeah, well, definitely that's where we go back when we talk about the class four. You definitely see there can be burns. There can be, I have one of my good friends, Dr. Juan Casillas, he's a laser veterinarian and he has uh, Erconia lasers and he has a class four as well. He uses almost exclusively the Erconia ones. And he says when he sees in the veterinary world, um, 
a lot of animals will come in from other offices that have used class fours on them and they'll have burns on their fur and burns on their skin as well. So I think that's one of the problems where I see where the time where I've had to be, and Rob, if you want to speak more on this too, is when I have a, a patient with a concussion, depending on how sensitive they are, a lot of times I have to start with less amount of energy. Like I had one particular girl who had a secondary impact. Now she was very, very, what we would call like brittle in a sense when she came in, she was agoraphobic, she was suicidal, she couldn't sit still, she was twitching. So when I did the laser on her, I didn't go directly over the head. I went on her body first to see how she could tolerate it. I told her, hey, as soon as you feel kind of amped up or a little off, let me know when we stop. So with her, I literally would do just a minute of laser because that's all her body could tolerate because she was so broken down at the time. So that's the only thing I've seen with our, our conia lasers. It's just some people we have to like see what they can tolerate and do a, a little less when it comes to some of the transcranial things. But with the other areas, I haven't seen a problem. Yeah, um, as far as uh, side effects to our lasers because of the photochemical research, literally none. Uh, right. And it's true. When you're lasering somebody's brain, you may not, you know, you may not want to go for eight hours on the brain. I'm using a, an extreme. I yeah. agree with that. And remember, the violet has an emotional component. Yes. So sometimes when people where I am in Westchester County, they're very emotional. They're on antidepressants. So you don't want to jack them up too much. But other than that, I mean, put the baby to sleep. There's no side effects. You're good. No life goes on and um, it's very what, what i like to say it's monday morning implementable mm -hmm. absolutely definitely and um, we've actually got uh, sasha's asked you know the question before about fda equivalent standards <clears throat> i'll be able to comment on this because she's saying it compared to other countries now you know the the fda is the benchmark it's a very well-run meticulous vigilant organization and, you know, Aconia have, as the guy said, 18 of the 21 US FDA clearances. Now, all of our studies, apart from the Lunula, um, which didn't need to be, are level one, placebo controlled, double blind, randomized studies. And as Dr. Kirk said before, we use LED for the placebo effect. So that gives us and enables us to make a direct comparison. And with it being double blind, obviously the doctors or the patients don't know what treatment they're actually getting. So, in Europe, part of the problem we have here is because the CE marking standards are so lax, we get flooded with a lot of lot of technologies. And most of these technologies don't have studies to back up the efficacy and the safety of what they do. A lot of them, you know, come from China <clears throat> and lots of other countries, and they just don't quite have to go through as vigorous a process. So predominantly most organizations who have as many fda clearances as aconia these studies cost a lot of money and these these studies are done to give reassurance to the doctor and to their patients that this this technology that they're using has been tested for safety and efficacy more than anything else so european standards will be changing it um, it's something called medical device regulations coming in which means i mean it's perfect for us if i'm honest because it means as of this month, unfortunately, it's been put back 12 months because of the coronavirus, but you will need to have a certain level of study to actually launch anything into Europe. So what we're going to find is, again, apologies for the croaky voice, a lot of the technologies that are here probably won't be here much longer because they haven't got the necessary level of efficacy and safety standards needed. Um, and if they want to start with their products in Europe, they're going to have to start doing top quality studies uh, to, to back it up. So that's answered that one. Um, sorry, that's another one. There's a few thank yous, a few great jobs, Dr. Kirk, Dr. Rob, fantastic webinar. Um, this is from Max actually, yeah, who you mentioned before there, Rob, who, as you know, has got an EVRL, which he got after your seminar that you did in London at the end of November. Um, he's also gone through the process to get an FX635 as well. Um, is there any preferred sequence to use the lasers for any MSK pain disorder, i.e. before or post uh, manipulation SOT techniques? Hey, Max, you know, it's great. I'm a low hanging fruit guy. People ask that question and I know they ask her that question all the time. If you can get the adjustment first, great. 
If not, use the laser, it'll soften the tissue and do it. If you get the adjustment first, it'll enhance the adjustment later because it'll tighten everything in a balanced form. In addition, always, 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 we didn't talk about it, always apply it to the brain after any kind of treatment. Um, and here's the beauty of it. You've got an FX, you can actually put the FX on and adjust them while the FX is going. I do that a lot. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. The one caveat I do is if I have a new patient to my office who's new to laser, I like to do the laser only on the first visit, really just because I want them to see what the laser did. That's just my own method when I'm thinking from a marketing standpoint and from a patient education standpoint, because if I do any other therapies on top of it, then the patient might think, oh, it was this that did it. Like, let's say if I even kinesio taped them, they might think, oh, it's just the tape that fixed me. I'm going to go buy my own tape or this or that. I like to do the uh, the laser only on visit one if they're brand new to my office. And then on the subsequent visits, you know, I'll, I'll do it in whatever seems to work well for that for that patient. It's because it, you could do it before or afterwards. It's all going to work either way. I do well say this though, if you have a patient who has a history of, they come in, they say, you know what, no one's ever been able to adjust me. I'm always really tough to adjust. Those ones I will always for sure start with the laser first because I find when you do the laser, particularly getting on the brain, it kind of resets those neural networks and all their paraspinals seem to really relax and it's a lot easier to adjust them afterwards. Have you seen the same thing, Dr. Rob? Oh, absolutely, it's so much easier. You know, the, the huge takeaway here is, the laser works extraordinarily synergistic with any chiropractic treatment and especially chiropractic manipulation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, that seems to be it for the time being. Um, right. I would just like to alert anybody, you know, they will be receiving a copy of this video. Uh, they'll be receiving a questionnaire as well. So we very much value your feedback. Um, Aconia USA and Aconia Europe in the Middle East. We all value the importance of education and knowledge. And as I always say to my kids, knowledge is power. Yes. So you know, we'll try to inject as much knowledge into you as what we can. And I think most of our existing, well, all of our existing customers will tell you there's a hand-holding process to start with, and we'll be there with you every step of the way. Yep. And I know my colleagues in the US will be exactly the same. So right. before my voice completely goes, um, I'd love to thank Dr. Rob and Dr. Kirk. I think the dynamics between both of you have been absolutely fantastic. The dynamic um, duo. Well. <laughs> Very much appreciate your time and your efforts. Um, so those who watch now, we're going to watch really quick. Dr. Dr. Kirk's going to be on my Facebook, Dr. Robert Silverman. Uh, so like my page, he'll be on Eastern Standard Time, 1 o'clock next Tuesday. And if you like what you saw today, I can guarantee you will be really geared up for next Tuesday. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's East Coast US for any Europeans. Correct. Eastern mm -hmm. Standard Time. We'll discuss that at a later date. <laughs> yeah, that'll probably be the same conversation as we discuss football against soccer. So, uh, <laughs> football. <laughs> I, played I, I played both. But, <laughs> but yeah, my heart belongs to, to, to football. No, nothing like running into somebody full speed and uh, delivering a blow. Yeah, exactly. Um, everybody who signed on today, we very much appreciate your time. And we are going to be discussing a follow-up video to this. This was part one, which was specific to musculoskeletal related conditions with the spine. Um, we're going to be discussing as a group what to do for either next week or the week after. So thank you for tuning in and stay safe, everybody. And we'll be in touch very soon. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thanks a lot.